welcome back to the burning bush once again i have with me father gavin father thank you for joining us thanks for that welcome rolwin we shall be discussing today the sacrament of reconciliation uh, we've got a lot of questions that you've asked which we shall be discussing also we've heard in your feedback and therefore we've put this on video i hope you enjoyed here are a list of questions this video might be slightly longer than the other ones and therefore you can skip to the time stamps in case you want to skip to a particular questions here are the list of questions question 1 what is sin the next one is what is the jewish idea of reconciliation or forgiveness of sins why do we need the sacrament then we shall be discussing how do i know that my sins are forgiven next is can the priest tell my sins to anyone what in case he does what if a priest is sinful do i still need to go to him for confession i feel extremely nervous about going for confession what must i do how often must i go for confession what is required for us to do a good confession so these are the questions that we shall be discussing father gavin let me begin with the first question what is sin like we have this uh no idea of sin rather i wouldn't say an idea of sin our idea of sin is that there is no sin in the culture today everything goes so what's our, what's our idea of sin or how should we understand sin especially when you're dealing with young people you get this get this question father but what sins do i commit why do i need to go for confession i get that very often in my confirmation class especially on the sacrament of reconciliation so i teach them okay we'll go for confession but i have not really sinned what, what have i done okay sometimes the most common thing they say yeah sometimes i get angry with my mom and my dad because they tell me not to do this and that but that's that that's about the idea of sin you know the idea of uh, sin is usually connected to what we were given when we were when we were in sunday school they would give us a list of things called the examination of conscience so you look at these questions usually they were from the 10 commandments have i used the lord's name in vain have i not kept holy the sabbath or the sunday have i not attended mass have i abused my parents have i not obeyed them and so on and so forth and along with that all the precepts of the church would also be questioned and then i had to or one had to really go through this examination of conscience and then go to confession so the idea of sin developed along these lines and then you you can always say i didn't do any of those so there's this prescription idea that we have okay these are the sins and these are what you need to confess so if you do not fall into one of those categories practical categories say. then you don't sin that is the idea of i mean that is one of the ideas another idea another way of approaching sin would be is this idea of a relationship where uh, i have broken my relationship with god or i haven't been attentive to it or i've broken my relationship with my my those around me my family my friends and then of course the relationship with nature where i kind of you know in a certain sense abuse or destroy nature and therefore we can that also add uh, we, we can also add the we've destroyed our relationship with our own self with ourselves not taking care of our health and exactly. not exercising and etc this is these are the these are the the kind of you know the this is an approach that is called the anthropological approach where it talks about a relationship there's another way of looking at sin it is anything that is morally unacceptable you do something morally unacceptable and that becomes the criteria for judgment and therefore what really is common to all of these is that there is always a negative aspect which gains a sort of a foothold in our lives where this negative activity is seen as is seen as something that would break our human spirit and therefore we need to ask for pardon for these sins and usually it involves as the second one says a relationship so someone or the other is getting hurt in the process, in the process. so these are the three ways of looking at sin there is another one and this is the one that that is really you know very often ignored and that is to look at sin as not being able to live life to the fullest or not being able to live life as god planned it and when you look at this so so when you say as god planned it would be a life of joy a life of happiness exactly uh, peace peace <laughs> not the peace that we say but the shalom peace the complete well being of a person so let's look at what god planned right at the beginning when he looked at us you know and we have this in the book of genesis man is literally the center of the universe literally 
not physically of course because you have you know that the earth does not yeah, the earth is not the center <laughs> of the universe so i'm not talking about uh, heliocentric i mean not talking in scientific terms but i'm talking in terms of you know the spiritual and the the relational aspect here where god puts man at the center of everything so creation is all in the light of man and really when when you talk about man i want to take you to this whole idea that man is made in the image and likeness of god as we had said in our first podcast and this image and likeness of god ma- means that man is made like jesus because jesus takes on flesh he became a man like us so adam and jesus were actually look alike and therefore everything that jesus is adam was meant to be so the first man who was made was adam and god made him just like his son like he would have wanted jesus to be and there is adam in the garden of eden and therefore you see already in the mind of god when he says let us make man in our image and likeness he wanted man to share in life as the divine trinity shares in life fully he knows who he, he is he shares in the whole of you know the how and why of creation now when i say the how and why of creation we see that creation it was made for man and man for creation there's this deep interlocking and therefore man becomes not just the crown of creation he becomes the steward of creation man becomes the steward of relationships because he is made in such a way that even he are like a lock and key in terms of their sexuality in terms of their life in terms of their their mentality in terms of their outlook to life everything they are like a lock and key so everything fits into place there are these composites that come together now god meant for them to live like him how does god live shalom god lives in this complete complete wholeness wholeness because. which does not have place for let's say an insecurity are you better than me is that particular animal living a better life than me is eve better looking than adam or does one of them have an advantage with god there is no there's no shadow of a doubt there is no understanding of being in competition there's no understanding of of being kind of you know i'm not trying to corner other people so that i can feel better about myself in god everything is so transparent so beautiful and it is this transparency that makes man free could we say that it is more transparency or is more completeness that god in himself is so complete so satisfied that he is not looking for something on the external to exactly. you know, to to fill us you know to or, or to make himself complete so god didn't need to make creation he didn't need to make human not kind <laughs> but he made it out of his love. genuine expression of love so if we are to be in the image and likeness of god maybe all of our actions will have to be an outpouring or will have to be a result of love it has to be a result of love and it also has to be with that initial understanding that you know there's no need to hide because whenever there's a need to hide then you go back to what adam did when does adam need to hide because till the moment that they actually eat the fruit from the tree adam needs no hiding he is with god god is walking with them god is in a relationship with them but then there comes this moment in which adam needs to hide and here is where you have a moment of doubt what if adam had to say lord, lord I here i am and i ate that fruit you told me not to eat it but i ate it even i both have eaten it i think we made a big mistake can we undo this it would have been great to know what the outcome was but here you have adam with his need to hide so sometimes i feel that god wanted adam to say that i said because he asked him a question another question then he doesn't answer so he turns to i mean adam does the brilliant he blames god and blames, and blames eve, eve. <laughs> the woman that you gave me so she blames the woman and he blames, and god. blames god and then he goes to even even eve doesn't say oh lord i i'm sorry yeah so sin is basically this need to hide sin is a, a need to protect myself from the other is a total lack of transparency you become opaque to the other the other can't see you the other doesn't know you and the other engages in a relationship with you hoping or thinking that you are a good person but you know within yourself and you judge yourself so even before the other can judge you you've judged yourself inadequate 
You see this in Adam and Eve. They judge themselves inadequate. So what do they do to fill up that inadequacy? They put together leaves, <laughs> fig trees. And they're covering themselves, hoping that their inadequacy or their supposed inadequacy, their nakedness will be protected from God. Actually, it is this hiding of the leaves. So I read that the fig leaves which they use, the sap gives you a skin rash. An itch. <laughs> and it gives you an itch. So therefore, just imagine Adam and Eve in their inadequacy or in their attempt to hide or to look better are trying to cover themselves and just making things worse, worse. than the worse. other. Worse than it was actually. And that is how that is how we human beings suffer from this lack of identification with the image and likeness. The more we become the image and likeness, that is the more we become transparent with one another. The more we become open to life. The more we be begin to be honest with ourselves. You know, I think here, that song, Man in the Mirror, is very important. You can fool everybody else in the world. But when you look at that person in the mirror, I'm not going to say man because it is very sexist. If you look at the person in the mirror, you cannot fool the person in the mirror. You can't lie to the person in the mirror. Why can you not lie to the person in the mirror? Because if you do, then you live a life, a dual life. Your true self has been crushed. And here the apparent self which you are trying to uphold, now you will move heaven and earth to keep up appearances. So as you are trying to keep up appearances, you begin to lie, you begin to put on layers of, of kind of, you know, no, this is who I am. And this whole setup then becomes sinful. It becomes heavy. And therefore sin is also referred to as burden. A burden. Why is it a burden? Because this inadequacy of yours which you feel, which is not real. Believe me, the inadequacy that man feels is not real. The only thing that you should feel is that God made you in his image. And therefore, when you've gone far from that image, the only way to cover that up or to make good is to return back to him. Anything else you do to cover it up, to fill that gap up, to make sure that you're not seen, that you're not caught, is sin. Now this is a very, very different way of looking at sin. Anything, anything therefore you do in order to protect a false identity of yours becomes a sin. This is a much wider concept. It's not just your relationships, but it is. it goes beyond that. It's your own self-appreciation. And your, the ability to look at your self-esteem, to look at the reason why God loves you. And every time you do not love yourself and you try to cover up your inadequacies and say, you know, if I am inadequate, people will reject me. God will also reject me. And that is when you give God a nice tight slap. Why did you make garbage? Why did you make me with, with these faults, errors, with, these, with, these bro with this brokenness, this vulnerability? You know... Uh, let's take an example. People wonder why they've been made shy. They cannot interact. And then, you know, if I put myself out there, what will people say? They may not like me. And so I cover myself. I become more of an introvert. Or I, um, I kind of, you know, interact in a manner that is very not me. And this is already a way of looking at yourself and saying, I'm not good enough. And therefore, God made me like this. I'm not good enough. God made me like this. And why did he do it? It's an indirect way of rejecting God's beauty in me. And that's sin. You know, uh, since we spoke of being inadequate, uh, since we spoke about you know re rejecting the thing, it is this that causes the burden. The rejection of uh, the image and likeness of God or looking at ourselves as inadequate Absolutely. Is, is what causes the burden of sin. And, and you could also say that this is guilt. We are guilty not of not having something or doing something or not being someone. Yeah. We are guilty of not looking at ourselves in the image and likeness of God. Exactly. And and right through Jewish history, we'll also see that they are paying. They are trying to pay off their God. guilt. They are trying to pay <laughs> off God. Yeah, God did ask them for sacrifices in 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 that sense, but it was. But I what is the idea of sacrifice, Rodwin? There, you've got to understand this. God did not ask them for sacrifices just for sacrifices. Over the sake of paying him. It's not a reparation for sin. Let us look at that. Why does God ask for sacrifice? Initially you will notice that God asks for sacrifice. As a sign of oneness. Being with them. As a sign of his fulfilling his promises. As a sign that they were willing to allow him. To work in them and through them. So he made these with the patriarchs. Now as Moses comes onto the scene. You will find that the sacrifice takes on a new 
light. You see that all this while, whenever there is sin, there is this, in fact in the whole of Jewish history, there is this push and pull. The push and pull being, you will find this especially in the book of Judges. That the people, they grow close to God because of their, because of their slavery. And they cry out to God. Then God sends them a saviour. And when the saviour is there, they become good again. They realise that God is with them. Slowly they forget about it and again they go back down into sin. And then God saves them again. So there's this climbing up, climbing down, climbing up, climbing down. With the patriarchs, they're very aware of God's presence with them. But then slowly as time goes by, they feel that, you know, they know God, they are aware of his presence and they slowly go far away from him. So how does God deal with this? God deals with this with very attempts to call his people back. That's that's also our life story. You said that. <laughs> you know, we, we, at, at one time you'll realize that, oh God, we'll, I, I feel so loved by God. And you have this whole uh, urge to come back to church and commit ourselves to church. And then after a few days, or to commit and ourselves to God, down. and then we go back down. <laughs> and then the Lord has to do something, says, hey, come, come back, come back. And, and So then that is the idea from the patriarchs and from kind of you know Moses and things like this when Moses offers the sacrifice of the lamb and then covers the you know the first Passover even there God has not kept their sin in mind not kept anything else in mind just his love and he wants to take them over so you see the sacrifice is still very much related to God's love deep love and mercy for them now once on maybe that's why we can say that that Passover lamb resembles Jesus Jesus so it is, it is not your sin, but my love for my you. The love Passover for you. is my love for you when Jesus on the cross is saying, see my love for you. Absolutely. And therefore, we come to the next part of uh, how God deals with sin in the Old Testament where the, the prophets keep reminding the people about their sin. They call the people, or they call the people's attention towards their sin. Amos and uh, Hosea. The other, Hosea. Every, uh, every prophets, you can look at the major prophets or the minor prophets, they are always telling the people, look, on that day, don't allow that justice, don't allow the justice of the Lord to spring upon you like a trap. Because you've been doing this wrong. And if you do not repent, and they talk about repentance, even Jonah talks about repentance. Repent, because the time has come now when God is going to send His wrath upon you. You must repent so that you will be able to so that you'll be able to enjoy life and life in God's presence. And then you see that there is this whole, they're, they're, they're struggling with the idea of God's love and on the other hand, they're struggling with the idea of God's punishment. So in the Old Testament, God is seen as a God of wrath, as a God who's now going to visit your generations with punishment because you have sinned. Actually, this idea doesn't come right from the patriarchs. It is a later development yes, because is. they have moved away from the image and likeness of God. And the more further you move away, you think that <laughs> God is going to punish me. And therefore, God, he will do this and he will do this and he will do this. So I better do something in turn for him. But when I say Old Testament, you must understand that, you know, even today, remnants and vestiges of this understanding that God is about wrath, that God is going to visit us with his wrath because of all that we do, does exist. Of course, we see this as used in the in the apocalypse as well we'll talk about that a little later but then we see that the prophets refine their treatment of sin they talk about they talk about the shepherds of israel they haven't fed their flock they've not cared for the people and they warn them of being taken into exile and this exile actually happens now when they've returned from the exile okay this is the time you know closer to the time of the birth of christ and things like this you know that they, of course, Jesus will be born much later. But when they return from exile, they rebuild the temple. And again, it becomes a very, uh, a very tight cultic practice. In order to repent, one must offer sacrifice in the temple. Therefore, you see this in the Psalms, no? A burnt offering. I'm giving you a burnt offering. And again, in the Psalms, it says, you know, you will not spurn a humble, contrite heart. What you ask for is not sacrifice, no? Burnt on the altar, but you ask for a humble contract out. So you see that there is this push and pull. The God of love as well as the God the who is a God of wrath kind of trying to burn you down because of your sin. And why is there this push and pull? This is very human. Because in the Old Testament we are discovering that God is this love. Because again in Isaiah he says 
how oh israel how lo, how often i have desired to gather you like a hen gathers her young under her wings very maternal in his affection for israel that the sins don't really matter i want to take you in but every time we try to do this there you are he also says in isaiah come let's argue our sins out i exactly. shall wash you <laughs> and i shall wash you and make you white as wool so the, the the question of sin is always a a a certain amount of kind of you know moving away from the image and likeness moving away from the transparency that god gave us at the start and it is also moving away from this uh desire that we have in ourselves to let ourselves be broken we always have something to prove we want to prove that you know in spite of all that i have inside of me i am good i am good and this is you know uh this is a little bit of a this is a little bit of a sad thing because we need not prove anything to anybody and especially not to god our ugliness is a result of perhaps you know our action but we've got to embrace this ugliness and allow this to be touched by god he doesn't want us to fix it up you cannot make yourself more desirable than you already are because god to god. loves to god, to god to god you can't make yourself more desirable to god than you already are because he already loves you so what are you trying to do now we therefore sin in the old testament is treated with this push and pull the god of wrath giving you punishment and the god of love who desires you with him. now this comes to a new light in the life of jesus jesus is always understood as uh, this one who loves right from earlier age you know the, the god of the old testament is different the god of the new testament is different because we actually see jesus who is a lot more compassionate one of my favorite uh, acts of jesus is the woman who's thrown at the feet of jesus and they come and they put her at the feet of jesus and they say lord the law says we must stone her and jesus writes on the ground etc but i think uh, the words he says if anyone is not sinned may throw the first stone everyone there was incapable of throwing the stone there was only one person capable of throwing the stone and he would not if they could they would but they could not and uh, that's that's the love that we see of jesus who actually picks up the woman and says daughter go and sin no more though it's not like go and do whatever you want but go and sin no more so we see that love so how does now how do we understand the movement from the god of wrath because a lot of us still understand him as the god of wrath oh he's angry with me and he will uh, that my sins my sins are affecting my children and their children yeah there is this dimension of social sin but because i said something or did something when i was 5 years old my daughter is paying the price of it uh, so how do we understand this god we've got to understand in the light of jesus's birth and his incarnation and his his giving of himself to us as a man remember i told you at the start that adam was made a look alike of jesus he is the image the spitting image and likeness of jesus and so we have what was unavailable in adam that is the transparency that god desired or had in mind for adam is now seen in christ a transparency that is beautiful when you look at jesus now what you see in him is like looking down to the bottom of a river you can see through those still waters you can see him through and through and when you can see him through and through you fall in love with what you see simply because of the kind of person he is and the gospel tells us this that there was something about jesus that caught the attention of people we are often told that he would walk up to people and say follow me and they are sitting down in the boat and mending their father's nets and everything and all they've seen him before they've heard him speak and you know there's something about him say we have found the savior often people misunderstand that as he saw someone who he never knew and he, and he went him. to them and said follow me and that person left everything and followed but that's not true because they would have heard him heard they him. would have seen him Surely. they would have you know walked around with him they would have his family members would have spoken about him and he was understood as a rabbi so for a rabbi to say come follow me was was something and then they see this rabbi living life with them in their sinfulness and yet looking at sinfulness very differently he does not look at sinfulness like a prescribed set of laws that you keep or you don't keep he gave them a sort of freedom that nobody else had spoken about especially not their rabbis especially not their scribes not their pharisees 
there was an internal freedom that Jesus had and he was not burdened by the burdens that they were carrying. And what was the burden that they were carrying? That they had to conform to a good life as prescribed by the law. So you keep this law and then you keep that other law and then you keep that other So for law. example, you wash your hands and yeah. you don't move so more than a few steps on the Sabbath, etc. etc. And you don't heal people on the Sabbath you and don't you don't people. crush corn on the Sabbath to eat and you know, so on and so forth. We are, I mean, at the risk of trivializing it, there is actually at the back of these laws a very good principle. And that principle is the principle of love that God gave to Moses. There is no doubt about it. And Jesus came to fulfill that law, as he says in Matthew. Don't think for a moment that I've come to abolish the law. Abolish he even an iota of the law. Yeah, not an iota of this uh, law <laughs> shall go away. But I've come to fulfill it. And then he fulfills it. How does he fulfill it? He allows us to see what sin really is. Sin is not insulting, kind of, you know, God by a very bad way of life. Rather, it is the inability to see what you are doing to yourself in the depth of your soul you are distancing yourself from your maker you are distancing yourself from yourself because who knows you better than God he made you and he knew the specifications of your body your mind, your soul and he loved it before you even had it and therefore when you take yourself off from there and you try to interpret yourself and you try to give yourself, spin yourself into this new person and you give yourself this kind of a, 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 an ability or oh, I have done this and I have done that, I have acquired this and I know that and I begin to lie about my, my brokenness and I try to put up a brave front. These, or I try to mend it in different ways. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> You know the kind of rough and tumble that we go through through daily life. From a very young age, we are taught that you have to compete with others in order to be someone who is good. So people will respect you only if you are number one. People will love you only if you have something that is different from others. So you have all these pageants, beauty pageants, where these women, they are over the moon when they win. And when they lose, nobody looks at you. Okay? We look at the film industry and we are so enamored by it. We want to be like one of those superstars. You know... Recently, you would even notice that young people have taken up to Marvel Comics, DC Comics and the others which have these stories of superheroes. We want superheroes. Why? Because superheroes are so strong. They never have to, you know, they don't go through the pains that we go through. And you see that even in these comics, they show that they do have a very tormented side. And this tormented side needs help. And that is what sin is, you know. is wanting to be this superhero, to be like God. That's what he wanted, no? <laughs> the serpent told him, if you eat this fruit, you become like God. I want to become like God, but by going away from him, not going closer to him. I think the, the, the becoming of God is not very conscious in our mind. So in my mind, I'm not actually saying to myself, I want to become like God. But at the back of my mind or, you know, in my actions, I'm so full of myself that I want to raise myself to such a bar. Uh, it, it's so common. I, I say to, I say it very often, you look at a group photo, who's the first person you look for? You look for yourself. So we, we are looking for for ourselves so much we want it's to it's like self gratification it's self gratification I'm, yeah. I'm so important and I need to know that I'm important and then I'm happy then I'm happy so if I'm not important I'm not happy and Jesus changes this all of this what does he do he's born in a manger to a nondescript family he's not important there it's not important yeah. then he goes on to kind of you know live a life of an itinerant preacher from one place to the other again not important so crowds of people follow him to listen to him and all of these things if Jesus were actually passing from their streets, they wouldn't recognize him. They just know that there is a rabbi who is saying something that is different and they are following people, going to this place, being fed by the 5,000 and everything. But they didn't even recognize him. That's why it says, when he, they were taking, to, taking him up the hill to make him king, he just slips from the crowd and he goes away. In fact, even when he was being crucified, they, I mean, if you really loved him that much and you really wanted to follow him, and they, there would have been a big ride because the the, the the Pharisees were initially afraid we'll not arrest him at the festival yeah, because, because the afraid. people will may make a ride but not that important yeah so you see that you know he never told his disciples you know make a noise about all that I've done in fact he runs away he does a miracle 
and he will disappear. The moment he, he multiplies loaves and fish, he puts his disciples, his apostles into a boat and says, let's go to the other side. Escapes any kind of, you know, making of himself important and everything. But in our human lives, we crave exactly the opposite. We want to make a spectacle of ourselves. We see Jesus is not spectacular. So sin is this, this desire, this unending desire to gratify that side of us which, which seeks that. Now, in itself, it is not a sin. But when it becomes a pursuit that robs us of time, like we are so obsessed by how we look. There are some people who go onto Facebook and if they put up or Instagram or one of these other platforms where if you haven't pressed like or if you haven't given them an appreciation or a good comment, they would die a thousand deaths at that moment because they want this to know or feel important. In fact, the virtual world has only amplified our problems and the understanding of sin has gone like, you know, two or three levels higher. I think what the social world has done is everybody looks so good. I, I, I look at the person, you put up the best of yourself on social media. No one ever puts up, you know, okay, maybe I don't look very good in this. That doesn't, it has to look good. We we'll click 10 photographs. With 10 different uh, angles, and, angles and stuff. Well, because I want the best. I want the world to feel that, gosh, this person looks so good. And, and that's, again, taking us more into ourself. So, you know, why is the sacrament required, could we say, to move us out of ourself and move us back towards God? The first reason the sacrament is required, I mean, the sacrament of, of penance, the church really calls it the sacrament of penance, is to first understand that we need to pay attention to this side of us that is not in consonance with our image and likeness. We've got to be very sensitive to the fact that we are moving away from the image and likeness. We've got to desire a return to our true selves. We're not even aware that we need to return to our true selves because we think that the self that we are now is the perfect self. We don't even realize, for example, that, you know, I'm a person who is so twisted out of out of kind of you know my true self that I enjoy this pain for example people living in in abusive relationships I'm talking about young people they have a boyfriend or a girlfriend who has made them change the way they think the way they dress the way they've gone about with their with their life in public and they feel so comfortable and so good they feel this is the best that has happened to them and suddenly this relationship starts to become abusive because the other is not respected. You are made to bend out of proportion to fit the desires of the other. And this slowly begins to rob you of your... Of your... Essence. Not only essence, of your being. And you no longer realize that you are in this. You are clinging on to that relationship because that is the only thing that gives you meaning in life. And actually you moved so far away from who you really are. You move so far away from the image and likeness. And so you need this sacrament to help you at least consider, at least consider that there is a better self of me that is possible. And that I need to work at it. Really, even we get this idea from the media that uh, we need to be something. So we strive, we move towards that. When we are young, our parents tell us, okay, this is what you're supposed to be. I remember often I was told in school at home, <coughs> look at that boy, look at the way he works, uh, look at the things he does. So, okay, aspire, aspire. And then we even begin to imitate some of the things that are not so good uh, because that also attracts. Uh, sometimes being being rebellious attracts. So someone is rebellious and everybody looks at him and says, ha, oh, he has something about him. And everybody so, listens when and he everybody talks. Listens. And everybody you know. listens. So, so the action of being <laughs> rebellious. I remember... Once when I was a kid, my parents were talking of someone and they spoke of him two, three times and they said the, his anger is on his nose. And because they spoke of him, you know, I started getting angry so that they must speak of me. So it is these actions that we learn consciously or subconsciously that are moving us away from who we are. We are not very conscious of it. That's the sad thing. So we are doing something, picking up a habit, picking up a habit, picking up a habit till that becomes very yeah. integral integral part of who we are, who we are. and then we are find it so difficult to to go back go to our it. real selves and you know live unburdened so the sacrament is really required to unburden yourself completely of all these unnecessary things the pursuit of happiness which is false because all of these things form part of a fast moving fast paced and and you know 
a life that really takes you nowhere. If you really pay attention to the things that matter, they're the things that you cannot see. They're the things that lie inside of you. And this is what this sacrament actually does. It puts you in touch with what you are, who you are. And it puts you in touch with the fact that there is brokenness in you. There is brokenness in all of us. And therefore we become aware of this brokenness. That is when you feel the need for a saviour. Because this brokenness is not something that you can fill or you can perfect on your own. No matter how much we try, we can never be perfect, perfect, perfect. No. In fact, the obsession to be perfect brings out the best and the worst in us. And sometimes the worst outweighs the best in us. And therefore, it is very important for us to realize, look, no matter how, how close I get to perfection, I am still going to be broken. And therefore, I need a savior to help me with this. That's when I begin to realize that I need someone who will help me and will take away this sin because I can't take away sin. I think that's one of the reasons why we say that Jesus didn't just declare from heaven you are forgiven. He came down into our brokenness to mend us from the inside out. And to show us that forgiveness, we will deal with forgiveness as a theme, that forgiveness is not something that you that you have to kind of you know tear yourself open to give okay just just before we go to forgiveness as a theme because it's there as one of our questions how do i look at my brokenness and take it to the sacrament Correct. of reconciliation <laughs> so here's uh, it deals with a few of the questions that have been asked you know uh, do i really need to go for a confession or not uh, i mean is it really necessary to be there uh, to go to the sacrament First of all, to understand sacrament as something that enables us to experience God, the fullness of His love, and experience experience the life of God itself. So, when we are experiencing a sacrament, we get a glimpse of the glory that awaits us, that God wants us to have. So, when you are in touch with your brokenness, and you are considering your brokenness in the light of the fact that Jesus came to save you, that he wants you to have this beautiful life with him. Then you begin to desire that life. Not only to desire that life, it becomes something that grows within you. Why can I not live unburdened? But if we do not allow ourselves to even go there, we consider ourselves, okay, I have no sins. Yeah, this brokenness is there, but I think it's normal because everybody is doing it and everybody has it. 90% of people are actually in the same soup. So, I mean, you know, why must I even beat myself about it? It's fine. I was giving this wonderful example. It says, everybody's driving a flat tire. You say, okay, the flat tire of the car is... Everybody's driving a flat tire. But the tires are not meant to be flat. They're meant to be inflated. <laughs> so, we are all roaming with flat tires. Where the tire is supposed to be inflated. And we're looking at the other and saying, hey, it's so there cool. are these there are these shows. I mean, you know, once upon a time, Oprah Winfrey was this very important person. She brought a lot of psychologists on board. And they kept talking about you know, brokenness and making it very commonplace. Oh, if this is happening to you, it's absolutely normal, it's good and it's this and it's that. And removing our sensitivity to a life of transparency and a life of kind of, you know, going back to who we really are. When you begin to consider this, you begin to see that you need the sacrament because you want to live authentically. You want to live as a person God meant you to be. And probably what you're doing right now is not really meant to be you it is not you and you will slowly begin to see this and therefore it's not particular actions this 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 and this father i did this and therefore i am not a good person or forgive me father for i have sinned and i did i stole somebody's money i told lies i uh, can you know bashed up my friend whatever it's not these particular actions but what lies under it i have not been able to be loving towards people because I really do not love myself. Now that's a deep thing and that shows your your readiness to work with your brokenness. Otherwise when you go to hear confessions as a priest, you know, sometimes it makes me very disheartened to see that people tell you, uh, Father, I uh, disobeyed my parents and I told lies uh, at office and uh, I took some of the office stationery. Yeah, that's it, Father. And then you're supposed to give them absolution and then you give them penance and they move away and then that leaves you thinking my dear child did you even understand what sin is really is it just these particular things that come and therefore in order to make a good confession one is 
bound to make a good evaluation of yourself and therefore you need to sit with yourself preparation for the sacrament is a sine qua non you can't imagine this and you know the gospel helps you you look at the calming of the storm you look at Jesus forgiving the woman and caught in adultery you look at Jesus dealing with his disciples you know they behave so dumb and Jesus has got to tell them everything he tells them parables they don't understand he's got to explain them all over again to them separately and so you know this movement with Jesus he does not condemn people but he kind of you know calls them to a, a better realization I think the, the when you're preparing for this sacrament we must not just see that okay I have done so and so act I let's not say for example I have stolen but why have I stolen the the why becomes more important yeah, or to absolutely. realize than the act of stealing or or I have been angry but why have I been angry Correct. Uh, or um, say for example I've been uh, jealous but the question is why am I jealous like I'm jealous envious but why am I really so jealous why am I really so envious so it's not the action as much as we need to confess or get the to core. the sacrament yeah. but the why of who I really am uh. so that the Lord can touch me you know sometimes I feel like it's like Jesus coming to Lazarus and saying Lazarus come out <laughs> so we come to the sacrament bringing ourselves like in the grave and this is me and uh, the sacrament being the presence of God says the Lord touches you and says Probably Lazarus come out come out <laughs> uh, come out of this come out of this and it's the you know many people have this you know what's the point you go there you commit the same sins and you're back to square one yeah that's that's one of the questions we got though I did, did not put it in the list the question was I'm always confessing the same, same sin sins. over and over again <laughs> like why do we need to go the same sins you know uh, so uh, the, the the question that really needs to be asked is have I made that that journey between the outward commission of that sin and the inward disposition? What is the meaning of that? Outwardly, I do this action, but I have not understood why I am led to this action. By whom am I led? I am led by myself. I am led by a negative conception of myself. So, you know, if, for example, um, I back answer my parents and I am not able to love them the way I am supposed to. Why am I always doing the same thing and I go and I confess the same thing? But at the back of my mind, I have something unresolved there. There is something that is holding me back. Maybe an incident, maybe something that has happened in the past, which I haven't been able to share with them and tell them, you know, this is what happened and I felt so let down by you. Oh, I felt in that moment that you abandoned me. Sometimes you don't even know that it exists. And that's why you need the help of someone human who understands you and says, okay, this is what is happening, right? Let's look at what you're doing. I think one of the best things we can do is to have a consistent confessor. Absolutely. I it, it's helped me tremendously. Uh, when I was in the parish, I had a consistent confessor. Here, when uh, Father Roland was there, he was consistently my confessor for a period of two, three years. Now we have Father for Fathers. Uh, now every time I go for a spiritual direction, I make sure to do a point of confession. So the same person can guide me, you know, to move from point A to point B. Often I see in the parishes, they wait for that Christmas or Easter where the priest, do it. <laughs> which priest has come from out who doesn't know me and I, and I go and just give him the list of my sins. See, we find it easier to opt for anonymity rather than a known person. So, a known person will be able to point me back to my sin, but an unknown person cannot join the dots. It's that sort of thing. But then again, let us think of it as, you know, you go to a doctor. You have a family doctor whom you know for years on end. Why do you trust him? Trust him because he's been with you in all the ups and downs of your life. And he knows you. And he knows how your body functions. He knows how many times you've fallen sick in the past and what could be a probable cause. And then even without batting an eyelid, he knows what to give you in order to bring you back on track. Half the problem is solved when you look at that doctor's face. You know, the psychological effects, the bodily effects. And this doctor is able to help you. In the same way, you need a human being. See, these days people ask you, no? Father, I can Google my, my, symptoms, my symptoms. And I can get medicine for it. But if you Google your symptoms and take medicine according to what Google is telling you, you will end up in serious trouble. You will end up even poisoning yourself and finding yourself in a hospital. Why? Because you need a human being there in between. It's not enough to have information. It's not enough to have, huh, 
this is what the process is this is how it works i got a lot of knowledge so now i know all of this and therefore i don't need anybody else it doesn't work like that you do need that human being to intervene so that you're not you're not blind while you do this also another question that we get asked is how do i know that this priest says you're forgiven gives me the absolution how do i know that my sins are forgiven okay <laughs> the forgiveness of sins the mechanism is such and if i can call it the mechanism because it is not the mechanism it is the working of god's heart when we see in the beatitudes god talks about blessed are the merciful because they will find mercy and the understanding of god's mercy is this understanding from the from the hebrew word ruham ruham means the love that is a love of the womb that is a mother loves this baby in her womb and this love is so unconditional that she knows in the future this baby is going to grow and probably this baby will commit sins will commit errors will probably back talk will leave me will abandon me one day this baby will really not be everything that it i dream of and yet i love it with a love that i cannot express i will not for the world exchange this baby with another one i will not for the world give up this baby at any cost a mother loves that child with that kind of a depth and mercy is that it doesn't care what the baby will do it has a protective covering of love over that baby and therefore when we acknowledge our sins now acknowledging our sins as i told you growing sensitive to sinfulness and going to the confessional itself has this power to bring us into the presence of that ruham that love that unmistakable mercy the covering of mercy that god has spread over us as long as we are oblivious to it it kind of doesn't work because it does not affect us but the moment we become sensitive to it and we come closer to it and we actually are in the presence of god asking for that ruham that is the time it starts to work and in the presence of that other person who is also sinful that person is also sinful therefore what happens it is this exchange of a belief we believe in that in that merciful love of that god and therefore that belief makes it work that this god who has this unconditional love for you and for me is going to make sure that as we listen to one another as we exchange this deep exchange of why there is sinfulness and how i can probably overcome it it is in this dialogue that sin begins to become less and less important and the image and likeness becomes more and more important the reason we ask why is my sin, is my sin going to be forgiven or not is my trespass going to be forgotten or not is god going to wipe away or not is because we give too much of of credit to my sin the sin is more important yes the action is more important so for example i've had a lot of women especially even men sometimes come and say you know i forced my wife to kind of you know give up one of our children and she aborted that child and now i'm living with the consequences father I have confessed this so many times but I somehow cannot get over it. So what has happened is that you know there's this deep wound created in the heart, mind and soul of this person. And they think wrongly of course that if they come for a repeated confession of the same sin they will overcome that damage that was done. The damage is done. But what we need to understand is that the moment you approached God with a sincere contrite heart that that action no longer exists for god he has been able to take that action and wipe it away and all he asks for in return is a loving response so now we need to turn our focus from the action to a response toward god which will be like god's action what is god's action he says okay let's let's not look at the sin let's look at life that you have ahead Let's look at the beautiful things you can do in lieu of what you actually did wrong. You know, in case I can say this, it says we're looking so much at our sin, and we are missing the mark. I mean, though that's what we call Paul. sin, because uh, <laughs> Omar, yeah. we we're supposed to look at the love of God. I look at how much God loves me. It's much easier to overcome my weakness. But because I'm looking, looking at, at my weakness, 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 I, the only thing that surrounds me is 
a weakness. I'm trying to overcome my weakness in a vacuum. Unless that vacuum is filled by the love of God, it becomes really difficult to overcome the weakness. One of the easier ways I find to overcome a weakness is to remember that God loves me. Uh, even when I want to do something for someone and I'm feeling too lazy to do it, I think, okay, that person loves me. When I realize that someone loves me and I love the person in turn, it's much easier to overcome that uh, particular weakness. Also, what helps you overcome the weakness is to realize that God does not expect you to be fantastically perfect. What He expects of you? To be faithful. To be able to depend on. To be able to love. To be able to return. He knows that you are going to meander. He already knows the, knows the fact that, you know, being who you are, you will desire your freedom greatly and that you will take steps away from it. All that he requires of you is to say, Father, you know what? I think I made a mistake. Can I come back home? That's all that's important. But if you keep saying, but you know, when I'm home, you know what I did when I went out? You know, I did this, I did that. Now, how can you love me when I did all of these things? You're asking a stupid question. Because he knew that this would happen. And yet, he goes after you. He helps you come home. And he's ready to keep you there. It's, it's like the sheep who got lost. What do the sheep do? I suppose at best it bleated. Ba, 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 ba. And the shepherd came. The shepherd carried. The shepherd took home. The shepherd celebrated. What do the, priest, uh, what do the sheep do? Nothing. Nothing. I think the maximum the sheep did was to allow the shepherd to carry the sheep back right. home. And there is this beautiful image in the Gospel of Luke. You know, the Gospel of Luke is signified as, I mean, you see a bull. Why do you see a bull? Why is the Gospel of Luke always, you know, when you want to depict Luke, for the Gospel of Luke, you will have the picture of a bull. Right? Why? Let me know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel within the Gospel you, is you the story ask, of... You want to ask them? No, perhaps I mean, you know, this is a little, a little not so well known, not so well known. But of course, Eastern theology reveals this to us. It is the gospel within the gospel in the gospel of Luke is supposed to be the parable of the lost son or the prodigal father, where God goes halfway as the son is coming back home. The father runs halfway, brings him back, clothes him and puts his ring upon his finger and all of these things and gives him his place in the house. What he does is, he slaughters the fatted calf. So in order to make good the return, and you see that, you know, the life of that calf is used for the celebration of the son's homecoming. So the life of Jesus is used as a sacrifice to celebrate your homecoming. So Jesus is that fattened calf who was sacrificed in the Gospel of Luke for you and for me. And so Jesus in the Gospel of Luke is that bull who was That's sacrificed beautiful. for us. So you see this understanding, a very deep understanding that you cannot do anything to get rid of your sin. But God can. All you need to do is to turn around and say, look, I want to come back to my image and likeness. And he says, by all means, I'll get you back. And what does he do to get you back? There his son has already died for us. He has already sacrificed himself for us. He uses, he uses his life, his love, his, his offering on the cross to wipe away our sins and to bring us back toward him. Then, now let's move to a few more technical questions. Yeah, sure. um, can the priest tell my sins to anyone? Well, the, I mean, the, 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 the moral implications of this are very severe. The priest can actually be uh, dismissed completely he will be under a excommunication, an automatic excommunication, if he does so. You know, and an excommunication is a rather heavy, uh, heavy penalty for a priest, especially. He cannot celebrate the sacraments anymore. So, if this is proved, and if this is kind of you know, if you can actually uh, give, this is what I said, and the priest used it or told somebody else, then it it becomes something that is kind of you know punishable by canon law and the priest is trained in order not to be able to kind of you know to remember these bring these to mind and then go and tell or gossip or whatever to give you to drive home this point of how important it is for the priest 
not to reveal the confession of people. Do you know that there was a saint in the past, Saint Thomas More, yes, and the others who heard the confession of of persons, and after being uh, questioned by the king, what did they say? You heard the confession. Was the marriage consummated? And they refused to answer the king because they did not want to break the seal of the confession. They were sent to their deaths. No, so many priests have gone through this pain of death and have not revealed. So there is this not only a a a, a, a very good uh, tradition; it is something that has held up among priests as as something sacred. You cannot do more recently when the cases of abuse were increasing there was this demand from the local authorities that when a priest hears the confession of a perpetrator of child abuse the priest is under no obligation to keep the secret he can go to the police and complain and it was completely refused it was theologically unsustainable it was discussed by so many can lawyers and by others and legal experts and they all came to the same conclusion cannot break the seal of the confession so we can be pretty rest assured that Surely. when we go to confession uh, the priest is not going to tell our sins to anybody yes rolman of course i mean you know i do i am aware that there could be aberrations certain priests could be doing it or have done it but that doesn't mean that the that every priest you see should be painted with the same black brush one more question that we got is what if the priest we know is a sinful person he's leading a sinful life he is uh, more angry and no one likes him because of what he does and the way he moves and uh, the way he interacts with people is my confession to him valid well <laughs> to start off with he is not a good example right that's the thing that stands in the way of people actually approaching him for a confession but if they do approach him and they do make a confession because you know sometimes uh, he is the only one available and you have to make your peace with god and then you decide to go there and he is there the first thing that you need to remember is that the sinfulness of the priest has nothing to do with the sacrament the sinfulness in the sense the personal sinfulness but he shares our sinful state and therefore while two sinners begin to discuss the mercy of god there in their midst god makes his mercy present so don't worry about his personal sinfulness you know the sins that he commits don't bother yourself with his sins because that is not what brings about the the forgiveness of sins it is god it is jesus he takes the place of jesus in the confessional he takes the the kind of you know jesus is actually working through him and the sacrament saint thomas aquinas says no happens with a technical term he explains it ex opere opera operato what does it mean ex opere operato that even in spite of the unworthiness of the person celebrating the sacrament the sacrament or the holy spirit the church supplies for what is missing in the person and makes god's grace available to the penitent so we really have to thank god for this beauty beauty that he has given us in that sense sometimes we will say i'm very nervous to go for the sacrament of reconciliation how must one in that sense overcome it the first thing you need to <laughs> understand is that you are not going there to be judged first of all the priest is not there to judge you or the priest is not really going to judge you or place you on the balance on the scales say okay sin not sin you did this wrong you're going to go to hell that's not the that's not that's not a valid way of making confession and definitely a lot of priests have moved away from this ancient fire and brimstone kind of confession you have to look at the com- confession as a place of compassion when jesus looks at you like he looked at the rich young man and he smiles at you you have to imagine christ present in that confession and a christ who is not a who's not a judgmental judge he's a judge but a good judge and a judge in the sense of the mercy of god not the wrath of god he is there to welcome you he is there the father to welcome the prodigal son so look at it as this moment of home homecoming you're actually going home to your to your father who loves you so much so if you're nervous and you think that what you say is going to shock the priest <laughs> then you're going to be nervous really 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 nervous but believe me from the little experience that i have have been ordained in 
there is nothing new that you can say that can shock the priest or that can kind of you know make him fall off the chair with oh my god you did this that does not happen in, at least in the modern times i think the last question what is required for a good confession what is required for the good con- for a good confession if you look at it canonically first of all it is a true repentance a true coming to terms with what is going on in your life a true coming to terms with the fact that you moved so far away from the image and likeness of god and now you want to come back to it that you've added to your life so much of the nonsense of the world that you can't even see where you're going once you have this and you wish to repent to go back to the gospel to go back to to go back to christ to go back to love then you don't need much more that is one part of the confession that is a confession of sins the next part is to make a reparation or oh, do your penance the penance is it is called a sacrament of penance because this penance solidifies your desire to repent so you are asked to pray or to perform an act of mercy or an act of charity or the priest might ask you to kind of you know put yourself in the presence of god and pray or go one one step ahead of yourself this penance is very important this penance defines how we make our way back to god and these are the two most important things to make a confession the first thing is the readiness to repent the willingness to repent second one the readiness and willingness to perform your penance with love because god is a god of love waits for you to come home thank you so much father for god joining bless. us could you lead us into a small prayer as sure. we close in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen god the father of all mercy you are a god who looks at us and sees yourself and therefore you call us to be with you to love you and in this love to share eternity we ask for forgiveness for not being able to see this love perhaps we've covered our lives with so much of the world with so much of the expectations of others with so much of a a drive towards competing with the world that we can no longer see you face to face that we can no longer be your image and likeness draw us back lord through the power of your holy spirit with the gift of the presence of your son in our lives so that we will be able to repent to turn back and to desire wholeheartedly to be your image and likeness help us to bring forth the light hidden within us to be the salt of the earth to be a city built on a hill lord this is possible with your help and this lent as we begin to crush the disordered desires of our life help us to make a good confession and to celebrate the sacrament of penance with true repentance and the openness to rejoin you in love we make this prayer through christ our lord amen thank you father for joining us i want to thank brother aston brother matthew who are here uh, behind the camera i must also thank <laughs> joel just so joel if you're looking at the camera thank you so much uh, and uh, must thank uh, i i think i forgot ignatius for helping us to to set up the room so big thank you to everybody once again thank you, thank you father gavin god bless look to have you back soon